So I thought tonight we could talk about the inevitability of enlightenment. You know, sounds like a bold statement, like, um, you know, how, how can anyone make such a claim? But the reason is that is that we're already that. It may take us a while to recognize that, okay. But the fact that whether we have yet seen that for ourselves or not, it still is as it is, and it couldn't be otherwise. And we can't avoid recognizing what we truly are forever. We might not recognize it for a long time, but we can't avoid it forever. So in that sense, it's it's inevitable. But the question is, if we just are satisfied with taking that on as a concept, it might have some comfort. But why settle for a comfortable concept when the lived reality of knowing that directly for ourselves in our own experience is possible. Yes. <laughs> so the good news is that um, nobody can give it to you. Nobody can take it away from you. This is our essential beingness. No one has the power to give somebody their essential beingness. They, everyone is already that. There's nothing to give. And I understand that um, some gurus and some late night evangelists can impart shakti, an energetic hit. You know, it can feel good. It can feel very good. It can result in claims of being born again or satori or a, a sudden insight. Beautiful. The issue is that, like all experiences, uh, it, it comes and goes. Right, it fades over time. It may remain as a, a beautiful, even useful memory, instructive, great, wonderful. If that energy is just imparted, unless there's a deep understanding on the part of the person receiving that energy, um, it can't really be sustained. Right. So it 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 fades over time. It's not recognized for um, what it truly is, the basis of it. So it's treated as an experience. It can be uplifting, but over time, it, like all experiences, it will fade and it'll remain as a memory. What we're looking for is what remains without effort. Our natural state. This is what the early Zen people talked about, discovering our natural state, that which doesn't require effort to sustain itself. Life isn't easy. <laughs> Anybody notice that? I mean, even, even for those that are very fortunate in their life, it still is not without difficulties. So to say life isn't easy, it doesn't mean that it's not can't be um, exciting and challenging and adventurous and stimulating and um, you know interesting mind and body sensations can happen. You know, wonderfully entertaining. It can be all that, and it still is not easy. Right? In Buddhism, they talk about as the the first noble truth. Um, you know, they can talk about it as um, unsatisfactoriness. But it, it basically comes down to life isn't easy. Um, and one of the reasons that it's uh, seen as not easy is um, things are always changing. Life is impermanent. Circumstances never stay as they are forever. You know, we'd like the good ones to last longer than they do. And 
we'd like the more challenging ones to last less than they do. But in any case, life has a certain movement, a certain coming and going. If if we accept that on its surface, I mean, like truly accept that, you know, we won't ever succeed in making life just comfortable and smooth always. <laughs> Things happen, right? You know, this is what the Buddha said 2,500 years ago, you know, talking about it, one of the characteristics of life is that it's impermanent. Yes, it's obvious. It's our everyday experience, right? But somehow we think, yeah, but I can sort of manipulate it, right? Manipulate it in my favor, of course, um, to make it what I want it to be, right? Manipulate it so that this body mind has more of the pleasurable experiences and less of the unpleasant ones. But the pleasurable ones and the unpleasurable ones are just ways that we have of interpreting what's happening, right? A different person might experience the same circumstances and, you know, might not be bothered by it or might think it's reasonably pleasant or um, might be okay with it, and another person might be totally bummed out by it. Right? So, seeing that, we can see that it's not so much the event or the circumstances, but it's how we respond to those circumstances. And if where we're coming from is sort of a demand on life that it be like I want it to be, then when it's not, we suffer. Right? cause of suffering. <laughs> Noble truth number two, <laughs> right? Life is impermanent, life isn't easy, and when we try to manipulate it to how we want it to be, then we're sort of uh, tossed about like a ship in the rough sea, like no place to, to settle. We're just constantly being in that turmoil of circumstances which we can't control. So when we when we feel like that life shouldn't be like that, or when we're trying to manipulate life to be as it is, and it doesn't turn out that way, then we suffer, right? Noble truth number two. So number, noble truth number three is there's a way out of prison. Good news, if we take this even as a possibility, then is it not worth our devotion to pursue that to see if see if it's actually true. Who knows? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But the only way we'll find out for ourselves is to actually um, go down that road and see if um, liberation is actually possible. So the fourth noble truth is, um, here's the path. Eight, eight right movements. You know, right action, right speech, right livelihood, right concentration, etc. So this is basically uh, a strategy that if we live our life in for the fullest possible um, compliance with these different aspects of our life, mainly to bring our life more and more into how big life is happening, then the assumption is that that will lead to liberation. The only difficulty is that, you know, these eight aspects of our life are sort of all encompassing. It's sort of like trying to juggle eight balls. I've seen people do it, but it takes an enormous amount of concentration and training and practice possible, but not easy. And when we're trying to do it from the perspective of me as a separate self, trying to get it right, um, there's always a very real sense of, you know, will I, will I get it? Will it, will it, uh, am I doing it right? You know, what about all those other times I didn't get it right? So it becomes becomes a very personal journey. And like I say, eight eight aspects is a lot to 
lot to get right all the time. So my approach is um, might be called the one path method. And th that being the first of the eightfold paths, the first, first is right understanding or right view. Right? And my sense is that if we get that one right, the others tend to fall into place over time. You know, practicing from the perspective of all eight is wonderful. Um, it will benefit us in the long run. But the most direct way is to get the first one, right understanding. <laughs> right understanding just means the recognition of who we truly are, the right perspective, right, the right view. If we get that one as our essential being has this spacious awareness within which everything happens, including these body minds, then when we view our speech or actions or mental processes or um, our concentration from the perspective of that spaciousness, they, they, they may still be conditioned, they will be, but it just doesn't seem that serious. Right? And from that more relaxed seeing, clear seeing of how those other aspects of our relative life appear, then they just tend to soften over time. Just from the miraculous capacity of awareness to heal because it's it's that awareness is willing to face whatever needs to be faced it's looking at our conditioning from a non-judgmental perspective um, and and remaining present for whatever's revealed right not running away not trying to fix it, just being present to see it. And the miracle of just seeing whatever conditioning we may be willing to see at any moment. Right? And so that just that just softens how we're looking at that. So this sense of coming back to this spaciousness, this presence, if we really see that, not as a concept, not as a belief, but just sense into that directly and just stay with that often, often during the day, come back to just that sense of being present for whatever's happening. Right? And then during the day, of course, some things, you know, we like and some things not so much. It, our job isn't actually to to love everything, you know, to try to manipulate our feelings. Of course, from the perspective of this body mind, of course, we're going to prefer some things over other things, of course. You know, so why why fight that? But just see that as um, not the ultimate nature of who we are. Right. So we can see it. We can say, you know, now this is pleasant. I'm enjoying this. Great. Wonderful. This is more challenging. OK. Are you willing to experience that also? Doesn't mean we have to like it. Right. The question is much simpler. Are you willing to experience it? Whatever it is. Might not be comfortable. Might not be nice. But it is what's happening. So what causes the suffering is to believe, you know, this is unpleasant for me and it shouldn't be happening. Right. Right. So any anytime we're arguing with what actually is happening, then we suffer. So this this practice isn't, you know, trying to trying to like everything or, you know, sort of divest ourselves of our preferences. You know, we'll have preferences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just hold them lightly. 
you know they're they're not they're not our fundamental nature so this this question of uh first get the right understanding the right view right this is not different than in christianity um when it said seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be given right? seek ye first the kingdom of heaven same seek ye first right view right understanding get that and all else will be given right it's much easier to juggle one ball than it is eight balls i've, I've noticed that if we can at least hear the possibility that there is a way out of this um, apparent confining view of life as being impermanent, unsatisfactory, causing suffering. If we can at least hear that there's a possibility of freeing ourselves from that, is that not worth our devotion to investigate that possibility?